Thank you, Namali. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I, I do want to add a little bit to that, uh, and I want to uh, first thank the organizers as well for inviting me to present uh, to the CE and Biotechnology and Pharmaceutical Industries Virtual Symposia. Uh, my addition to what Namali said is that uh, I've been involved with CAS for, oh, many years, over 20, uh, and I've presented at, at quite a few CAS uh, symposia, technical conferences, as well as regional conferences. And I have yet to present at CE and or attend CE, and it's a bit ironic to to me because um, some of my background that Amali was going over in, in, in terms of um, my work in the laboratory was actually with capillary electrophoresis. So all of these years, I had some hands-on experience with CE, but I'm talking on other topics. So I'm really grateful that I now get the opportunity to. Um, attend and, and present at CE. So uh, I, I want to thank the organizers for that opportunity. Um, so this topic uh, relating to the role of quality systems and quality culture and CE lifecycle management, I, I, I see is quite different than, than some of the technical topics that, that have been presented so far at, at this virtual symposia. Uh, but I, I want to make a case for the, the importance of this um, because a, a, as you know, in, in the title, uh, we're, we're developing this technology for biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries who have commercial products uh, and who need to control uh, the quality of those commercial products with a variety of analytical technologies, CE being very critical for, for many of the products uh, that, that are, are um, marketed by, by biotech and pharmaceutical industries. And when those products are in, in a commercial realm, uh, then, um, and they can be there for a long time. You see on the bottom right of my slide, Amgen is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So we can have products on market for a long time and we need to be able to continue to innovate around those analytical technologies, including capillary electrophoresis. And therefore we need to have um, robust, agile and efficient life cycle management around our analytical methods. And so uh, this, This is a topic that topic that part because we you can see many examples of of inefficient uh, life cycle management related to analytical methods and so that would um, be a problem that would be that would take a lot of attention from health authorities as well as as well as uh, the um, marketing authorization holders and so a problem that would take their attention and resources but without any benefit to the patient and so continual, this is a topic, as I said, near and dear to my heart that I think we can make some progress on uh, that can have a real benefit for our patients as well as for all the other stakeholders in, in, in providing um, pharmaceutical medicines to our patients. So with that introduction, let me um, transition to, to my, my presentation and, and talk about what I did over the summer. So in COVID, um, you know, many folks like uh, myself are, are working from home uh, and um, we do our best to social distance and wear masks and wash hands, but uh, it still need to get outside. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough to live in New England where there's quite a lot of good hikes. And so these are some pictures I have from uh, this summer. Um, so if you take a hike up in the White Mountains, you can get these nice views like on the left. But to get there, you have to walk through the trees. And um, I see that you know there's a lot of commonality amongst some of the forestry in the wild. And then on the right, you can see that this can be the uh, growing trees can even be uh, a commercial enterprise. And you can think about uh, these Christmas trees as having a, a finite set of critical quality attributes. And one could do a design space around how grows how one grows a Christmas tree. So thinking about quality by design for Christmas trees is a part of my thinking around life cycle management. Um, you know, there's a development aspect to it, but uh, a lot of the interesting scenes uh, on, on these hikes occurs, um, you know, you can see some quite scenic views and some surprising views on these hikes. Uh, when you look at uh, trees at the other end of their life cycle, uh, either the uh, natural on the left, I think that was quite the aesthetic to my perspective, but uh, not one where you could think about a, a, a fixed set of CQAs that would define that picture on the left and what it would look like in the end of the life cycle. Or on the picture on the right, you can think about the environmental impacts on, on, on the product and, 
So the trajectory at the end of a life is difficult to predict. And there's a little bit of chaos, I would say, associated with um, life cycle uh, uh, in, in, in forests. And so then I, as I'm walking along and doing these hikes over the summer and thinking about the what I'm going to tell you in this presentation, I think, well, maybe there's something that we can learn about that in terms of how one in, in the development aspect and how as we develop technologies, uh, there, there's some degree of predictability. We put a lot of effort into that predictability, but we also need to think about the additional challenges for managing uh, uh, equipment, facilities, et cetera, older technologies as they approach the end of their life. And, and so the, the, this introduces a whole new set of, of factors and concerns and, 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 and challenges um, a, a, as we move forward. So that was my philosophical thought that uh, I, uh, occurred to me as I was hiking this summer. And, and, I'm, uh, I, and that's why that kind of struck, that led me to structure this talk the way I did. Uh, so let me now transition into that talk. I'm gonna go over four uh, broad areas around uh, life cycle management and and uh, and specifically around quality systems and end with quality culture. So we'll talk about the pharmaceutical quality system and uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of ICHQ10 with a focus on change control. Now when you read that document, you think about it, at least historically I have thought about this document in the context of product and process development. But a lot of these concepts, these QBD concepts, uh, are also relevant, I, I, would, I would advocate, with respect to method development as well. So change control for method, change control concepts in Q10, uh, I, I would advocate, are also going to be relevant for method change control. So that, that we'll start with that overview. Then I'll, then I'll introduce the problem statement with respect to analytical method changes. And I'll talk about that from a high level with this one voice for quality global perspective about some of the challenges that we have with, with life cycle management. And then I'll, I'll get quite granular in terms of a specific example. Uh, Namali was talking about some of the functional areas on, underneath my remit. And so we had a relatively recent example uh, that, uh, that, again, reinforced uh, to my, my, my uh, history uh, where I'd seen in the past as an FDA reviewer, some of the non-value added challenge the efforts that uh, everybody needs to go through relating to older methods. And so I'll, I'll give you some details around that specific example. And then we'll talk about what um, capillary electrophoresis method lifecycle management could look like. And I'm gonna build upon the ICHQ12 document. Q12, as you know, reached step four in November of 2019, so less than a year ago. And uh, I'll, I'll provide some of the overview of that. Um, it's a relatively extensive document. Maybe you've read it already. Maybe you're implementing it already, or maybe it's new to you. But I, I think it would be good, uh, um, worthwhile to go over some of the framework there. I, I want to compliment the, the expert working group as well as all of those who worked on Q12 for providing uh, a, a nice, not only a high level framework, but, but some, some really good detail around what LCM could look like. And there's a specific example in Q12 relating to capillary electrophoresis. So we'll, we'll go over that. And then finally, we'll talk again about quality systems and this concept of quality culture as a way to um, uh, add into the degree of confidence that one can have with respect to uh, a company's ability to provide effective change control and evolve a method uh, for, for commercial products. So that's where we're going to go in, in the next uh, um, uh, 40 minutes or so. So let's start talking off about Q10. Again, this is a, 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 again, I'll keep it at a relatively high level. The pharmaceutical quality system is described in ICHQ10, and this is one of the core figures there. And it, it builds upon the concept of life cycle. As you can see here, we go from development to tech transfer to commercial manufacture to discontinuation, and it describes what's GMP, what's not in, in that life cycle. Um, there are PQS elements, uh, I'm not gonna read those, but the enablers are very important here related to knowledge management and quality risk management. And again, I wanna emphasize all of this is relevant for, uh, for, for method development and execution. The key messages in Q10 is it's a guideline on the essential elements of, of a pharmaceutical quality system throughout the product life cycle. It complements other ICH documents, including the pharmaceutical development document Q8, as well as the quality risk management Q9, as, and uh, I, I, not on this slide because this is an older slide, but Q11, I did work on ICHQ11 expert working group, which is a Q8 of kind of development concepts as applied to drug substance. The, it also complements Q11 as well. 
implementation of a PQS should provide enhanced assurance of product quality. So it, it, it works in conjunction with, uh, with GMPs. And so a, a PQS is a, a key component of that. So as I said, let's focus in on, in terms of that picture, on, on the commercial part of the life cycle, as well as the change management system, which is one of the, uh, one of the four PQS elements. So Q10 does have some guidance around, around that. Um, the enablers, I also want to provide some overview of. On the right, um, you see the risk management framework from ICHQ9. Um, and this is fairly well established. And in my mind, uh, there's been a lot of good effort uh, to implement these, uh, the, the, the QRM effort, uh, framework here. Um, on the left, we talk about knowledge management. And I, in, I, in my opinion, I think this is maybe a little less um, mature in implementation and relative to risk management. There's a, some, some uh, inherent systemic barriers uh, to good knowledge management. Knowledge management is defined in Q10 relating to the acquisition uh, and storage and distribution of knowledge. But these barriers are something I, I would submit that are present in all of our organizations. Hierarchical ba barriers and working all the way up from the staff who are just starting at the company at the lower levels all the way up there, there can be barriers to sharing that information. Excuse me. There are functional barriers um, that, that, that can exist between functional areas within a company. And then when you combine those, you can see fragmented knowledge islands that, that, that can be present. And so these, uh, these organizational challenges make it difficult to have effective knowledge management. But when you do have effective knowledge management and risk management, then you, that can facilitate decision making. Q10 emphasizes the continual improvement of the product. And so we, there's going to be, on, again, on the commercial part of the life cycle, a variety of inputs and then adjustments of the product life cycle adjustment. Um, and so also think about this in the context of method development as well. Um, just focusing on the bottom, you're continued to gather knowledge about the method and you'll get expanded body of knowledge throughout commercial uh, implementation of commercial distribution of the product around your methods. And then if you modify that those methods or evolve those methods, then you, that can further expand that body of knowledge. So there's feed forward as you initiate a change and then feedback as you learn about the effects of that change. So that's Q10. Now I'm going to talk about the second part of my talk, which was an elucidation of the problem statement here related to life cycle management. And first, I'm going to talk about at a very high level. These are some slides uh, from this initiative called uh, the One Voice of Quality. Uh, and so this is sponsored by chief quality officers or CQOs for many of the companies associated with this conference. And so the One Voice of Quality is focusing in on post approval changes. And um, I, I, I have some really nice slides here, relatively recent, as you can see, that describes the problem statement. So let, let me give you the first the high level view of the problem statement. Post-approval change is inevitable, according to one voice of quality. And I would agree with that. To continually improve, maintain a state of control and to ensure product availability, that, that it will happen uh, because a facilities age, uh, routine operations require updates, industry practices change, supply chain and suppliers change, product and process knowledge grows, technologies evolve, regulatory requirements evolve. And as you know, all of these, these, four, these seven bullet points are going to be applicable to capillary electrophoresis as utilized in the commercial context. Managing change is a regulatory expectation. Many post-approval change require prior approval. And so then we're introducing some complexity into the timelines and the logistics associated with uh, management of that change. There's a quote here on the bottom from the European Union GMPs part one, chapter one, which aligns with the Q10 concept that continual improvement is facilitated through implementation of quality improvements appropriate to level of product and process knowledge. So when we think about the global problem statement, um, companies are globalized and ideally we have one product for one world. Um, uh, in reality, we have one product with over a hundred approvals. And so if you're going to go through a change, then we start at the top left here. 
you have some new knowledge and um, the company says, well, I need to make a change in my method. And so then they will submit that to an individual uh, health authority who then will provide some uh, assessment of that submission, maybe some questions, maybe an approval, maybe a not an approval. And so that's the view from the regulatory agency. It's focused in on the specific change, the specific company. Now on the right here, you see the post-approval change visibility for a pharma company. So if you're in over that that exercise on the left is multiplied times 100. And so some of the complexity is spelled out on the bottom of this slide, whereby you can see that individual health authorities will have different assessments on the categorization uh, of that change. Some will call it major, some will call it minor, um, and maybe some will say there's no reporting. Uh, those countries that call it major will say, well, you know, I've got some questions, uh, and they'll send those questions, and many of those are common questions, but many of those are different questions. Some of the conclusions will be that um, I like this particular change, but I want you to add this element. Um, and then if you've got uh, 19 different additional elements uh, onto that change, then you, you know, do you harmonize around all of those elements? Uh, that it, 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 again, as you can see, there's a degree of complexity associated with the exercise um, from a global perspective. Then you multiply that in reality by the fact that many post-approval changes are in flight at the same time. Uh, and so, uh, the logistical challenge uh, is multiplied yet again. Larger companies have thousands of post-approval changes awaiting approval at a global level, level every year. And so uh, this, this gets into um, um, a real, a real uh, difficulty in terms of making what's approved in what country at what time and, and assuring that the product that's released in that country is, is consistent with the application. So all, all of these in, uh, communications need to be appropriately managed and controlled. Um, and so th this is the, the 1VQ, nice pictorial showing some of the complexity around the, compl uh, uh, the post-approval changes. So that's the global view. Now let's talk into the, the, the get, let's, let's zoom in uh, um, quite a bit and look at some of the, the specific challenges. So obviously change is not impossible, right? We've uh, just in, 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 in my career, you know, I, 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 as a graduate student, I was running gels. And then as a postdoc, I was doing CE. So, uh, and, and I see at, at FDA, when I was at FDA, I could see products that, that, uh, that were released in, uh, via older technologies or newer technologies. And so this slide just shows evolution of electrophoresis uh, from, from uh, slab gels uh, to CE and, and the, um, how, how the, the advantages of working in CE relative to slab gel. Nevertheless, there are st some older products that are still uh, released via gel electrophoresis. Uh, and so here's the, the example I was alluding to earlier. We had a product, an older product, that was released uh, uh, using reduced SDS page. And, and on that commercial product, we were, were trending the stability data uh, for a specific drug product lot. The, the tests were performed at uh, two sites, site A and site B. And when we were looking at that data from site B, we saw that the 95% confidence bound intersecting the intersected the specification prior to expiry. Now the testing that was performed at site A did not show any apparent or perceived increase to drug product. So it was only the testing at site B that um, raised this concern. So key background here is that um, when the product was approved, uh, regulators required a very tight acceptance criteria close to the limit of detection uh, of the um, of this SDS page, which was quantified using densitometry. So here's some of the data around that, uh, then differences in the SDS page data between the two sites. The drug product stability data um, at site B um, had results, had more data points that, uh, that are greater than or equal to the limit of detection uh, relative to site A. So that densitometer at site B uh, showed apparent greater sensitivity relative to site A. And because there were more data points than the way this particular test reported out related to main band, then that led to a lower amount of main band. And so then when we looked, saw that instability, then the site B was beginning to trend out. Uh, but you can see when we take that same lot and compare it from site B to site A, the site B results were around 2% 
lower than that for site A. And so the, there, there was only uh, the, um, um, the, the, the introduction of the, of, the, of the measurement at site B was the source of the issue. There wasn't a quality risk in terms of the product or, or a risk that the product was actually um, going to um, have a change in attributes that were relating to um, an, an, on stability for the, for the product itself but it was only relating to the, the sensitivity of the densitometer at site B was the, was the, uh, the source of the issue. So the likely root cause here is that site B SDS page method appears to generate results with more sensitivity as compared to historical data that we saw at site A. This enhanced sensitivity is thought to be based on the densitometer. Same model was used at each site, but because we're, we're, we're nature of this specification, um, we, uh, we, we have this particular challenge. Again, there's no impact on quality, but this is the related to the method and what's reported. So one actual solution that was discussed seriously is do we need to shop on secondary markets for densitometers with equivalent sensitivity? No one is gaining by all of this effort or that it doesn't have an impact as to set the quality of the product, but it is a significant effort to, to assure that the, the, the uh, or to address the perceived issue relating to stability as measured by the, uh, the, the method at site B. Instead, uh, we try to, uh, I think we can try to find a win-win. Wouldn't the ideal solution would be to update the method, uh, for example, the capillary electrophoresis. And however, uh, in addition to the, the one VQ view that I showed you earlier and the complexity of updating the method, uh, there's also a significant time frame associated with this. And so that's the problem statement. And I would like to propose that it would be better if we could leverage principles in ICHQ10 and then Q12, which I'll talk about next, to allow rapid implementation of low risk improvements. I think that would be a much better situation. We maintain reliability of control of the product. Uh, we have increased agility in terms of our ability to, uh, to uh, innovate. And then we do that in a much more efficient way and efficiency that is gained not only by the marketing authorization holder, but also by health authorities, um, which then increases availability uh, for, for our patients. So let me now transition into Q12. Uh, as I said, it reached step four in November of last year. And it starts, there's quite a bit in Q12. There's, a, there's a, um, the, the parent guidance as well as an annex. Um, so each document is uh, 30 or 40 pages long. Uh, so this is just some summary slides from the Q12 expert working group. And I want to start off with the change management. I already told you about Q10 and, and change management in the Q12 document. Uh, aligns with that. And that's what this slide shows is the alignment between Q12 vision of change management and the Q10 vision of change management. Uh, and so um, I, I won't further elaborate around that. Um, there is some additional thoughts uh, around Q12 relating to change management. Uh, it's important that the, the, the pharmaceutical quality system is the responsibility of a company. Um, and um, and change management across and the, and the, uh, the marketing authorization holder is responsible of, um, for that change management across multiple sites, outsourced or not. There's this also concept here, which I won't go into detail just in a matter of time, related to established conditions. Those are defined in ICHQ-12. Um, so any change to an established condition should be communicated in a timely fashion, as, as, as I, I um, listed in Q-12. Just like Q10 had one of a kind of a core figure to uh, um, identify the concepts. This is one of the core figures within Q12 showing the relationship between knowledge management and change management processes. So I mentioned at the top some of the challenges with knowledge management relating to uh, hierarchical or functional area um, um, divisions. Um, here's some of the inputs, though, that can go into knowledge, knowledge management for commercial programs, starting off with corrective action, preventive actions, management review, development activity, as one would expect, process and product performance review monitoring, past changes implemented, the, pharma, the product quality review, and others. So that a, as you accumulate this knowledge in the commercial context around your method, in, in my example, then you may see there's a stimulus for change around the method. And so then you do a change evaluation, uh, as you see on the bottom part of the slide, and you look at this from a scientific and a risk-based approach. Uh, you determine the data that are needed around the change. And then 
I think uh, maybe somewhat underappreciated is that there must be an internal change approval um, around that. And so to assure uh, that the change will continue to provide the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, assurance of quality as, as was present before the change. Now, if that change is such that it's of a magnitude that requires prior approval, then we work our way to the right and we provide that to the health authorities. And then we get into that one VQ loop that I was showing you earlier. Uh, and if you get approval, then you implement it and that becomes knowledge and, and that becomes uh, you can have that virtuous cycle between change management and knowledge management. If the change is of a magnitude that it doesn't require, if it's a lower risk change, then per Q12, then that, that becomes a notification if required. And that could be notification before the change or notification after the change. So it's, as I said, it's a nice figure, kind of gives you a snapshot of, of, of the relationship between knowledge and change management. Um, and um, that's something to keep in mind as, as we continue, as we talk about some of the Q12 implementation concepts. Now, Q12 does provide, as I said, not only a, a nice high level view related to life cycle management, but actually some really nice detail around established conditions and life cycle management for um, uh, um, analyt analytical procedures. So some of the established conditions for analytical procedures are listed here. Um, these should include elements which assure performance of the procedure. The extent of established conditions and reporting categories can vary based on the degree of understanding the relationship between method parameters and method performance, method complexity, and control strategy. So this is very much akin to some of the uh, extensive text in Q12 around established conditions for manufacturing processes, but those same concepts apply to analytical methods, right? So um, different approaches can be used to identify established conditions. So for, for your analytical procedure, when there, you have more limited studies around that analytical procedure, that may result in a narrow operating range window to ensure method performance around the method uh, uh, description. In such cases, the established conditions may be extensive uh, with fixed and or tight conditions for that method if you don't have, if you have limited knowledge about the method. Conversely, um, if you have enhanced understanding about the method and how the, that method relates to the attributes, that then that it can ensure method performance, then the established conditions can be reduced or focused on the method performance. So for example, method parameters, acceptable ranges rather than set points and performance criteria. So there's a, there's a there's kind of an enhanced and a traditional approach that'll apply for when you're identifying established condition for your analytical procedure. Now, the next few slides are, are I'm going to be flipping back and forth over the next few slides just because I want to um, go over this, this, I think, a very powerful concept within Q12 as identified in Annex 1C. And that is the identification of established conditions for analytical procedures. So rather than focus in on you know, numbers one through seven for now, let's just keep it at a high level and looking at this slide, what we're going to look at is um, a, set, um, a, a set of a, an established condition. What does it mean if we change that established condition uh, with respect to a reporting category? How do we go about changing that established condition? And then what would that, how would that then translate into a reporting category? In order to translate change to that established condition to the reporting category, there are two things we have to understand. The conditions that must be met, and there are seven of them spelled out here, as well as the supporting data, the documentation that needs to be submitted for that change in the established condition in order to justify uh, that reporting category. So what does that look like? Uh, let's go through an example. And this is why I thought this was relevant for this conference is that the Q12 Annex 1C has an example relating to capillary electrophoresis for, uh, for this case on non-glycosylated protein called elustropin. Right, and so we have an established condition on the left. Uh, in this case, the equipment that we're using, uh, the, the CE, the system, the detector, the capillary material, the diameter of that capillary, the length of that capillary are all defined as established conditions. I find myself in a commercial context, uh, I'm using this method to release product and I need to now evolve that equipment in some way, uh, different type of equipment, different length of capillary, uh, et cetera. Um, I want to be able to do that easily without prior approval. So here in this context, notification low would be in the U.S. Uh, changes being effective zero or an annual report. Um, 
Or in Europe, it would be a type 1A variation. In Japan, it would be a minor change notification. So in order to uh, make this change and then have a notification low reporting category, what do I need to do? I need to have conditions to be fulfilled one through four and then supporting data one, four, and five. And so let's look back on conditions um, that must be met. And the one through four uh, says, for example, there are no changes in the limits acceptance criteria outside of the approved limits of the approved assay. So no change in the, in the limits or acceptance criteria. That's If that condition is met, move on. Uh, the method of analysis is the same or based on the same analytical technique. If that condition is met, let's go to look at number three. The modified procedure maintains or improves performance parameters of the method. That's good. Move on to number four. The change is not concerned potency testing. That's great. Let's look at the data that you need to submit in this context. I said one, four, and five. So if there's updated drug specifications reference to the change method in the specifications, you need to provide that in the submission. Number four, comparative results demonstrating the, um, in this case, if we change in the length of the capillary, for example, that the, the approved and the proposed analytic procedures are equivalent. So you provide those results in, this, in, the, in the CBE zero or the annual report. And then five, justification for the proposed drug substance investigation. So if, if there's any change in the test, acceptance criteria, analytical procedures. So if you meet those conditions to be met and you provide the supporting data, then you have a notification low and you can evolve your equipment without prior approval, okay? So that's a great deal of detail. And I gotta tell you from an ICH perspective, uh, usually they're much higher level than that. But I think in this context, it's very, very helpful uh, for practitioners such as you and I about how we're gonna go about evolving our methods in, a, in an efficient manner. There's another example here related to site transfer. Uh, you can have, uh, you can do a site transfer for your CE method related to Illustropin. Uh, you can have it such that it's a notification moderate, which means you need to submit before the change or notification low, which you can submit after the change. They both have the same supporting data. The difference here is the conditions to be fulfilled. Um, if, so the site transfer, if, you don't, if you're not meeting any of the conditions, then, then that is a notification moderate. But if you're meeting conditions four through six, which are here shown, the change does not concern potency testing, the change, no change is made to the test method, and the transfer is within a facility approved in the current marketing authorization for performance of the test, then that becomes a notification low, right? And you can make the change and inform after making that change. So a really nice example, um, and it's just partial list within Q12. This is built upon uh, a WHO approach relating to post-approval changes. So uh, you could foresee filling this out for any type of change related to capillary electrophoresis and, and putting that into uh, a product lifecycle management plan and getting the approval from health authorities moving forward in a much more efficient way than, are done, that, than was done before Q12. Okay. So um, that's in the case, Annex 1C was in the case where you have defined your established conditions. Well, Q12 was just released in less than a year ago, so it's very well possible that you have not defined your established conditions. Q12 does provide Annex 2, which is a structured approach to analytical procedure changes that can be made with immediate or other post-implementation notification for legacy programs without defined established conditions. Now, there are a variety of cases where this does not apply. And so there's a carve out where this structured approach I'm about to go over is not going to be applicable to, to you. So for example, if your method or your procedure have criteria that does not adequately reflect the complexity, for example, you have a peptide map, for example, where your acceptance criteria is conforms to reference, well, there's much greater complexity into that than, than is reported. And so um, the Q12 would say that's not going to be applicable. You need to have um, criteria that adequately reflect the complexity of the product and the method. So the, the criteria need to be uh, appropriate. Secondly, methods based on biological, immunological, et cetera, principles or biological reagents are not applicable to the structured approach. Uh, Model-based or multivariate methods are not applicable and methods described in monographs are not applicable. Um, there are conditions to be met before you apply the structured approach. The physical chemical basis and description of the method, uh, the current and the intended method should be the same. The method validation acceptance criteria, the current method can be applied to the intended method. 
and validation results demonstrate that the intended method is equivalent and or better than the current method. So I'd like you to think about, and, and, and as I'm going through this structured approach, think about my particular problem statement that I that I shared with you earlier, relating to the the, the densitometers with with different um, sensitivity, and ask yourself the question. Maybe we can go into this in the Q and A. Do you think this structured approach that I'm about to go over could be applicable to to the, the the particular case that I presented? Would it be possible using this structured approach? to evolve from a slab gel uh, a reduced SDS page uh, with densitometer to CE using this structured approach and then implement that um, using a, a, um, an immediate or other post-implementation notification approach. So um, the, 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 there were the conditions that we met, I spelled out here, number one, and there's number two, the test results between the current and intended methods should be equivalent, acceptance criteria should not be changed unless tightened, and talks or clinical data are not required as a result of the method of change. So let's go through the this 10 step process uh, and um, and then you know ask yourself the question about the change that I just talked about. So if you're going to do the structure change and you're looking at the, 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 the two methods, um, you must first evaluate the physical chemical basis in the method description. You must have a prospective analytical validation protocol aligned with ICHQ2. You must identify appropriate system suitability criteria. Uh, execution of the validation protocol should meet all acceptance criteria. You need to if, not only think about the method change, but also consider new product information. So the method change should have no adverse impact on safety, efficacy, purity, strength, identity, potency of the product. So you don't want to have, um, you may learn more about their product and therefore you don't want to evolve from a, a, an older method to a met, newer method where those learnings are no longer applicable. So that's what um, step five encompasses. Step six is to prepare a written summary report document in the outcome of the validation. Step seven, follow internal change process. Um, then after the change is implemented, regional reporting requirements, complete post-change monitoring via PQS change control, and all information related to this change should be available for regulatory inspection. So that's the that's that's in a nutshell is Annex Two, uh, and and that structured approach for method change uh, within the absence of established conditions. So I again I'm, I'm I want to provide compliments to the Q12 expert working group for providing that I think really helpful guidance. Now um, let me now um, move to some more one DQ approaches around this. Uh, this is coming out around the same time. Uh, from 1DQ and some additional thoughts in addition to Q10 established guidance as well as Q12 um, and how we can actually go about implementing this in, in, a, in, a, in a defined way. So the objectives of industry quality leaders are same as Q10 objectives. We want to achieve product realization, establish and maintain a state of control and facilitate continual improvement. And so the Q10 model, which I showed earlier, uh, when we think about post-approval changes, we we, we funnel information through um, the um, through that that framework, and where we capture and trigger signals, we respond to those signals, and we verify effectiveness. And so there's some publications in the PDA journal about that overall vision. Um, there's also a really important document that came out also around November again November 2019, same time Q12 came out uh, from the PICS, relating to how one can go about evaluating the effectiveness of a pharmaceutical quality system in relation to risk-based change management. And I want to take a little bit of time. I'm not going to go through all of this text, but I do want to take a little bit of time to uh, highlight uh, what PICS came up with here in their recommendation paper. So very much similar to um, what, the, what um, the 1DQ picture I just showed, there's a change proposal, um, and then there's a change risk assessment. So, and then there's planning and implementation. I think additional text here relating to some detail here on the far right related to change review and effectiveness. And so this is important in terms of that, um, if we go through that structured approach and the inspector comes on site, you wanna be able to have all of this information available um, to demonstrate that the PQS is, is adequate uh, in terms of looking at the changes. So the change review and effectiveness is spelled out in, 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 in a lot of detail here on the right. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over that, but it, I think it's a very helpful 
set of guidance from PICS related to uh, risk-based change management. Um, 1BQ also put the, the, the post-approval changes um, through PQS, also through um, this capture, respond, and verify effectiveness view. And they did it in a manner that it aligns with Q10. So you see the, the PQS elements in green here in terms of capture, respond, and verify effectiveness, and the management responsibilities in orange, and the enablers, the Kate, the knowledge management, and the quality risk management in purple. And so this provides um, a nice view building upon the PICS approach as well as Q10 as you think about uh, the implementation of that change within a pharmaceutical quality system. Um, key piece here is to think about what do we mean by an enhanced science and risk-based approach. Uh, and so there's a, um, a variety of calibrations, a, a lot of this relating to uh, the risk tolerance moving forward. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail here, but there's a calibration and alignment um, between the company and the assessor on the post-approval risk level. That's shown in the middle on the bottom there. And then there can also be a level two calibration and alignment between different country assessors on a post-approval change risk level. So this gets into another concept, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to go, go over, relating to reliance. And as one health authority looks at a change, um, and, and, a, and, and couldn't there be some reliance from uh, amongst health authorities about looking at specific changes, in which case then there, this calibration and alignment at level two becomes more important. The 1DQ effort continues, and there's going to be some effort to um, spell out some more practical post-approval change examples. Uh, there's uh, one already, number one is in terms of uh, administrative changes to excipient suppliers. That one has been published, but you can see there's a whole list here. Uh, and one thing that's uh, spelled out here, look at number seven, is that analytical instrument upgrade is another practical post-approval change example that the 1DQ group is, is uh, planning to work on. So let me now talk about quality culture. And, and I think the reason this is important is, um, um, well, the, the, this specific slide talks about the importance. Just, just take this, at, at, you know, forget everything I just said and, and look at this from a fairly high level. This is a, a study coming a published from Harvard Business Review and not even necessarily relating to pharmaceuticals. Uh, but it, it, it identifies that the quality culture is, is, is key for manufacturing quality. And, and there's a this quantification of the costs associated with a mistake. And you can see the hours and the wages and the number of employees and the annual cost to resolve an error. If you have a quality culture, then you're less likely to have that original mistake. And so there's a strong quality culture ensures reliable patient supply. Now, this is important, the culture foundation to be tied to company's core values. Uh, and, and building a strong quality culture results in significant savings. Uh, the, I think this, the, the reason I, I, I put this slide here is I think the quality culture is also an important um, uh, way to assure health authorities uh, relating to uh, change management system for commercial uh, products. Uh, and so um, there, this is an ongoing effort, parallel effort to the Q12 and the PICS and the 1DQ relating to quality culture and how one can go about uh, showing a quality culture uh, specifically uh, that can be applied to change management. So um, quality culture attributes are, 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 are spelled out here by my colleagues from Amgen, Celia Chen and Steve Mendeville. And so they were involved with PDA effort to do a site assessment tool. And so the site assessment tool would then send survey to manufacturing sites and ask a variety of questions around these these topics, these five topics related to leadership commitment, communication and collaboration, technical excellence, continuous improvement, employee ownership and engagement. And there were quite a few questions around that. And then the specific site could be graded related to these quality culture attributes. And, and that could be, um, even though they're soft factors and we're getting more into social science than some of the hard science that, that we, you and I are com more comfortable with, you know, this is something that would be informative in terms of the culture at the, at, at the, at the site. And, and, um, and not only um, address some of the, um, uh, can address, uh, provide a further assurance to health authorities to the extent that one could quantify that. And so that's what this slide shows is that 
when you do attempt to quantify that, you begin to show correlation between quality behaviors and a maturity quality program. And so then the FDA and this umbrella on the far right is moving more towards quality management maturity and quantifying that. So I attended the PDA FDA meeting a few weeks ago, uh, and there was a, a lot of discussion about quality management maturity and how one goes about demonstrating that. Uh, Amgen, as many other companies, is involved with a, a quality metrics pilot program with FDA. And so we're looking at ways to uh, identify the appropriate metrics to demonstrate quality management maturity. So that's an ongoing discussion. And so the idea here, if you look at what's underneath that umbrella, there's the QMS. There's some of the concepts that we talked about relating to change relates, for example, performance management, continual improvement. Um, there's going to be metrics. There's going to be predictive analytics, um, a variety of things that are going to be important relating to quality management maturity and, and demonstrating that is going to be helpful in terms of providing a, a further uh, uh, degree of assurance to health authorities. Because I think part of it is that uh, if we think about the Q12 approach, it, 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 it has a, uh, a view that's recipe driven. And, uh, and as, you, as you know, there, you can follow a recipe, but there's all, there's all things that are outside of the recipe that need um, a quality culture and needs a, the appropriate perspective on the part of the practitioners. And so having this additional view of quality management maturity and measuring that is a way to uh, provide that further assurance to health authorities. So I think throughout my career, I, I, I see an evolution of, of methods and the ability to do this in a manner that's reliable, agile, and efficient as, as, as a win-win, uh, both for health authorities and for, for main, uh, marketing authorization holders. Um, the idea is we're all focusing on what's best for patients. The current system whereby um, um, uh, in, uh, companies are struggling with older technologies it does not provide efficiency and agility. Uh, and so it, it, it's my strong view that driving towards more PQS only managed method changes where we evolve the methods over a period of time to, um, to while increasing reliability, um, it, it increases agility and, and efficiency without compromising reliability, I should say. So that this is the win-win, which I, I hope we can continue to work towards. Um, and I think it, it, it's, uh, it's something where Thanks to um, uh, efforts from Q12, uh, 1DQ, and the uh, PICS, then I think we're beginning to see a pathway to make that happen. Let me acknowledge my colleagues from, from Amgen um, who provided me with some thoughts and some slides and some data here. And with that, I will um, close my presentation and look forward to your uh, questions uh, next. <laughs>